So welcome to Songbird Oak Arena. Thanks for inviting us to the Oak Arena Festival. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here with all of you. And it's been so uh, inspiring and educational to hear all the presentations so far. So this is Songbird Oak Arena. We are in sunny Los Angeles. And uh, we always have our mask close by. As you've probably noticed, it's hard to play Oak Arena and wear a mask at the same time. So we're, there's a lot of this going on. But we will survive and we will make do. So thank you again for having us here. And let's see if we can add to our experience of our Oak Arena enthusiasm and our excitement for everything Oak Arena related. So welcome again. And I would like to add to the conversation by sharing some of what we're passionate about here and some of what is inspiring us to um, grow in, in our Oak Arena playing and making. And so I'm happy to share with you some of my latest inspirations and musical adventures. So what do we have here? Uh, to thank Eric, my office elf, who is holding the camera. And at some point we're gonna flip the camera around and he's gonna share with you some of his musical passions. So there's been such a amazing presentation so far. So I figured I would go in a slightly different area You've learned so much about how to make an ocarina. You've learned about um, what's popular in, in, in ocarina land and in, at the conventions and from different glaze finishes and such. So I'm gonna dive right into some of the, the musical aspects of what's been inspiring me lately. As you know, a couple of years ago, I became interested in sound healing and the possibility of sound as being a, an experience that can actually transform your body, your mind, your soul, and as experience of uh, sound meditation, using sound to, to heal, to find peace, to en enhance your meditation. And in that regard, you've probably heard of binaural beats. And what is a beat? A beat is two frequencies that are close together, and they're so close together that instead of hearing a harmony, you hear like a, a fluttering or kind of a wave pattern. Uh, piano tuners use this beat to, to tune a piano. There's a lot of compromises involved and they're listening for those, those beats. A certain frequency of rhythmic, a rhythmic frequency of beats allows you to tune a piano correctly, at least to equal temper. Um, they've discovered uh, about 30 years ago that beat frequencies can actually entrain your brain into reaching uh, states of mind that are closer to sleep or meditation, alpha, theta and even delta waves, you can emulate those patterns. And so I'd like to share with you just a little bit of what I've been exploring in that realm and maybe it'll, it'll um, be interesting to you as well. So this is a kind of a gentle place to start with the two bass uh, ocarinas that are tuned uh, together in, in unison. And then with holes, instead of playing music with these holes, you use them to slightly modulate the frequency so you're uh, you can modulate the beat between the two notes. Now, what happens with the beat, as the notes are very close in unison together, a little bit off, you'll hear the third frequency, or the beat frequency, is the difference between those two tones. And as those, tunes, those tones separate, the beat frequency will become higher and higher frequency. So let's say you're starting at two beats per minute, and then it's uh, 10, and then it's 100. Well, by the time it gets to 100, then you start to hear it or even like around 30 or 40, you start to hear it as a low bass note. As it gets higher, it becomes higher and higher until it, it's into um, kind of a, a, a tenorish tone. And as the frequency between the two notes becomes like a fifth, then you're hearing a chord. And that third tone, which is the beat frequency, that's what you wanna pay attention to because it's the one that seems to stimulate or entrain your, your brain in such a way. Now, of course, it's, it's better in the, in the live uh, form. There's something about the organic sound of the pure sine wave frequencies coming off of an ocarina fiddle that is, uh, has the most profound effect. There are, of course, uh, apps and uh, electronic versions of beat frequency generators. In, in fact, I use one on my app that helps me go to sleep at night and creates a, a steady tone. There's something really special about creating it with your breath and the absolute pure frequencies that are happening from an organic instrument. And so we're all about 
the organic instruments. And sometimes I joke and I say that the ocarina is a digital flute because you use your digits to play it. So with that in mind, here is what a beat frequency whistle sounds like, or at least an approximation through your, your speakers. I'm not sure how much of that comes through. If you get kind of a general idea, another advantage of doing this type of work is that doing a long breath really chills out your mind, the thinking. It's a, a form of, of yoga or meditation that's very, has a long and storied history in the East. And it is a very useful aid to reaching a more relaxed state of mind, especially if you're have some anxiety going on or a busy day, it's a good day to relax, good way to set your mind, shake your etch and sketch, so to speak, and start with a clean slate. So um, here is a version of it with a slightly higher frequency, it's a little bit more intense. And when I first introduce people to beat frequencies, I like to start with the bass one, it's very gentle. I'm still not sure how it translates through the, the Zoom call, but um, perhaps leave a comment and say, I didn't hear any beat frequencies or I did, and uh, we'll take your feedback and maybe I'll, I'll switch to some other things if this isn't working. But here's, here's the next level of intensity. Now notice I am, um, I'm tuning the, the two chambers. Instead of playing musically or a binary on or off, I'm, it's kind of like tuning a radio, an old fashioned dial where you're turning it very fine and I'm, I'm listening for those B frequencies. Okay, here we go. I'll just do three breaths on this one. Sometimes I get carried away. feedback the high end is cutting out but the beginning is audible okay well in that case i won't even bother with my soprano model now this is the this is like instead of a sound bath this is taking a sound shower like a cold shower um won't even bother with this one it's probably not going to carry through i'll give you one too just just in case now this can be kind of intense if you are prone to epileptic seizures or have severe uh, ptsd around sirens you might want to mute your audio. So I'll give you a second to, to do that. If you're someone who um, uh, is prone to seizures, you might want to sit this one out. I'll just do one breath, okay? Just, just for fun, take a step back here. This is pretty intense.
Wow, okay. No, we did that, so interesting. So I began an exploration of interest in geometry and this is a dodecahedron. It's a 12-sided polyhedron where every angle is 60 degrees. There's 12 faces. And I was curious what would uh, a sacred geometry or a platonic solid sound like as a resonating chamber. And I always remember the first time I, I made one of these and I started playing it in the workshop and, and everyone who came by stopped and was like, whoa, what's that sound? Because it, it did have a unique timbre and the, a very nice resonance. So um, this is a sacred geometry ocarina and here's what it sounds like. exploration of sacred geometry. So what's next? Oh, how about this little guy? So I wanted to see how small could I make an ocarina? And this is maybe not the, the smallest ocarina, but it's pretty tiny. And so when I made this one, it's a very cute little sound. And as I made this one, I noticed the birds started singing around me and I thought, I should make a bird caller, an instrument to tweet with the birds and uh, have a interspecies communication device. And I thought, okay, well, how do I do that? Um, this is too small, it's not comfortable to, to hold. What if I make a very thick walled, larger ocarina with a tiny internal chamber, but a larger size on the outside, unless the tweeter was born. So the walls are like that thick. And it's got this, these big holes so that you can modulate the sound without playing notes, so I didn't want it to be mistaken uh, for a musical instrument. I wanted to make sure that you were using it just as a way to communicate with the birds. And what I noticed was every time I would play this, the birds in the neighborhood would start chirping and one of two things happens. Either the birds start chirping or I notice the birds and I tune into the, the bird frequency. And, um, but I hear it from everyone, they're like, wait, does those birds just start singing? So I'm not sure, so I gotta do some double blind test, see if the birds do start singing or if I just start noticing them. But anyway, here's what the tweeter sounds like. So this has been fun. It's, it's great when I take it out of nature. I swear I've had some great conversations with birds. I've gotten some great stories from people who are like made friends with their neighborhood birds who actually came up close and started um, become very curious what was going on over there. Um, what's next in Ocarina land? So another passion I have is ethnomusicology. You know, it's studying the music of different cultures. And I've had the great good fortune to travel to some countries where I love their music and I was able to study music with, with local people, villagers in their huts, learning folk music and in the deserts of India and in uh, remote villages in Turkey with um, with old men who lived in, in little huts and played uh, their flutes and in various places around the Middle East. I've got to study in Egypt and in the desert of Israel and in, uh, where else have I been? Um, also in Italy. <laughs> and so it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's such a, a fascinating world of music out there and it's, it's so gratifying and fun to learn music from from someone and, and, and learn their folk songs and wow what a passport is music and you can come into a, a, a village or a town hear a song in the radio figure it out on your ocarina and the next thing you know people are inviting you home for dinner and want to share with you their music it, it is it's so deeply nourishing on a, on a soulful level so I've just started making ocarinas that are specialized in various keys. Now my first one that I made like this after traveling to Costa Rica and seeing some local ocarinas there and I saw that they they were tuned in a almost minor pentatonic scale where the first three holes are about the same size. They go up a minor third 
and then the last, the second two holes, the fourth and fifth holes are larger and they bring you up to an octave. And I was like, wow, that's brilliant. And so I took that idea and started making minor pentatonic styles. Let's see, I think I have one right here. And so the minor pentatonic is really lovely because, uh, you know, it's like there's no wrong notes. Every combination sounds good. And so it's, it's a very easy for beginners who are just going to just start throwing their fingers around and everything's going to sound pleasing and harmonic. Although, you know, people will manage to find a, a way to make some things sound harmonic. It's, it's about as close as you can get as an idiot proof ocarina. But. It's also the scale of the Native American flute, and we'll get to that in a minute, but it's also the Japanese shakuhachi flute, so it, it really spans the globe as a, as, a, as a cherished scale, and so I've had fun making flutes in the minor pentatonic scale. Um, okay, so what is next would be one in the harmonic minor scale. So the harmonic minor scale is the scale known as he jazz. And it is a very popular scale from Morocco all the way up to Turkey, all through around the Mediterranean. And this is the snake charmer scale. And actually, funny story, I used to sell ocarinas on the beach in Santa Barbara on a weekly uh, show that, that caters to people visiting Santa Barbara, the lovely beaches and mountain town of Santa Barbara. And so I had a, a stall there for many years. and one of the things after the hundredth person said to me, where's your snake? And so I made a, I got a basket about this tall, I cut a hole in the bottom of it. I cut a hole in the table and under the table, I got an, a car antenna rigged up to a car battery and a, and a foot switch that could make the antenna go up and down. And I attached a puppet of a snake that I had got in India years before. And so what I could do is with the flip of the switch, I could make the snake rise up out of the basket and then with my knee, I could kind of make it go side to side while I'm playing the ocarina. And as soon as that snake would pop up, people would jump back and scream and I'd laugh. And it, was, it was a whole lot of fun. Those were some good old days, I miss those days. But anyway, um, that is the harmonic minor and it's also known as hijaz. And so just this week I thought, okay, well I've got hijaz, that's a lovely one. And here it would sound like on a, on a tenor, a little bit deeper sound. So what happened there was I started improvising and after a few seconds of improvising, uh, a tune uh, welled up out of somewhere and it reminded me of those notes and a song that I hadn't played or remembered in many, many moons and it just popped up and I love how songs bubble up out of an improvisation. So a lot of times I'll just start improvising and then I'm like, oh yeah, and I know so many songs, but they're not in my... Uh, my random access memory, they, they're, they're in my very random access memory. Yeah, read-only memory, they're deep in there somewhere and they, they have to bubble out. They're called forth by uh, a, a situation or an improvisation or a request. And so that song is from Armenia. I don't remember the name of it, but I've heard it. And I learned it a long time ago and, and they, I love how songs bubble up. They have a vast library of songs and sometimes you just need a catalyst to, to bring them up. 
So that brings me to a flute that I just made this week that is in another scale from the Middle East, and this is known as Saba. And Saba is a scale that we played early in the morning, just uh, around sunrise, and it's a very meditative mode. And this one, I made a special addition to the mouthpiece where I, I put a, a hood over the mouthpiece to kind of uh, shade the sound a little bit and give it a kind of a breathy, sandy tone. I learned this trick when I was in Armenia where the, um, I had a, a fiddle flute and the, the gentleman who was, who was the, the grand wazoo of this instrument, he got a Coke bottle, uh, the little plastic ring that, that you discard as you open the, the cap and he slid it over and blocked part of the the windway or part of the fipple and so i created a little hood here to to block the fipple partially and so what it does is it get it adds an element of breath and there's an instrument in the middle east called the ney the ney is just a tube of reed and it's an inblown flute and they they consider the breath to be an, an essential ingredient of the sound unlike a traditional ocarina or a, a recorder where you're going for that super pure sound you're going for a more uh, windy sand swept sound and so that's what I was going for when this one and I literally just pulled this out of the kiln on Friday so I'm um, excited I I got excited last night I I, I have a, a stairwell in the building that I live in and the acoustics are really great and I go there at late at night and um, and jam out and I'm always in search for great acoustics so I'm walking down the street and I see a, a parking garage or a stairwell and I'll, I'll, I'll just hop in and and play whatever I have in my pocket or I'm wearing at the time. And it's always a fun moment until someone comes in and goes, what's going on in here? But it usually works out pretty good. All right, this is Saba. And you'll notice it's a very exotic sounding scale. And this is a specialized flute. It only does Saba. There's not really any uh, cross fingering opportunities. So it's, it's one of these specialized. And I figured, you know, um, an ocarina that you can play chromatic and you play all the, all the notes of the scale, that's really great and really useful. And I figured looking at the popularity of the handpan world and where handpans are each in one individual tuning and they only do one thing, but they do it really well. And ocarinas are kind of the, uh, the handpan of the, of the flute world. And so I figured, well, I can specialize and make flutes that just do one, one thing and do it really well. So here's Saba. But you know, for this one, I think we should go in the hallway, get a little bit of reverb in, in, our, in our hallway here between the office and the workshop. Got a little bit better acoustic, so let's go in here. Is this interesting for you guys? Are you bored or is this fun? All right, well, Eric can see what your response. If you're bored, then we'll, we'll jump ahead. It's but. so fun, fun. Okay, cool. All right, so here's uh, Saba. I interrupt this musical interlude to tell you one thing. There's a note in here that's not on the Western scale. It's not on the piano. It's in between the E and the F. It's called uh, E half flat. And a half flat, it's not actually half flat. It's about 33 cents flat off of the E natural. And so it's known as a half flat. No, it's not actually E. It would be if you were in the key of C. So it's the third is uh, slightly flat. And so see if you can hear what note that is, the one that's that's off the chart, so to speak, but it's it's such it's so characteristic of music of this region of the world. So back to the music.
with Saba and hot out of the kiln. Still a little bit warm. Not really. Is that, is, is that interesting for y'all? All right, what's next? Okay. Um, this is a new shape. This was, um, you know, we also get requests and I love requests. They're like, hey, can you make one like from the song from the sea? Make one like a seashell. So this is a, a prototype of a seashell shaped ocarina. And I think we are gonna get into making seashell shaped ocarinas. And I thought of, of a great name for it last night. I'm gonna call it Michelle. So anyway, this is Michelle. I'm going to make a, a, a deeper one, maybe in, in the key of tenor F. So there's that one. All right, moving right along. Let's do a uh, crystal light up ocarina. All right, here's another one fresh out of the kiln. I'm really, this was also a commission. Someone's like, can you make me one that is in a kind of a lighter color with the crystal that lights up according to the frequency of the tone? So this one's in G. And it's also tuned in the minor pentatonic scale. And I've been having fun with um, getting a fipple sound. You know, that's a real crystal, a real quartz crystal. And the color of the crystal is going to light up to the frequency of the note. And this is something that we've, we're very excited about, a synesthetic experience of music. And according to several synesthetes that I've encountered with this, they're, they're very impressed at the, at the the accuracy of tone, even though people have different colors associated with different frequencies, uh, the experience is, is similar. rainbow up from red. Red to red. I chose G to be red and A to be A, oh, orange to be A and C of green and then D is blue. So anyway, it is going up built from the key of G. Now here's a larger and denser version of the same thing and it's fun to play with um, different tubular sizes. I've been really um, curious about tubular, the tubular sound so it's, it's like an ocarina uh, mouthpiece but in an open tube and so here's how this one sounds. Okay, inspirations. Who has seen the dark crystal? The dark crystal. So the original one that came out when I was a little boy, I was like the perfect target demographic for the Henson's uh, version of, well, even the new one is a Henson version of the dark crystal. And who's seen the new one? Um, it's absolutely amazing. Totally holds true to the spirit of the original. And so in it, in the, like one of the very first scenes, um, there's a scene in a, in a little 
canoe and a little rowboat and, and Jen is playing a, a double flute, double pipes. And I, in honor of that, I, I made this um, double chamber tuned in octaves, uh, harmony double, so. a magical sound and I love getting the overtones of the harmonies correct and it creates a whole chord and there's even like four tones there's an upper harmonic and a lower harmonic so I love fine-tuning until we get those harmonics in tune and then you're playing a whole chord which is two notes and so with that I think we're gonna bring our master multi multi-chamber ocarinist into the mix and I'm gonna take over the camera duties and Eric my office elf and now ocarina making elf because he's made his first batch of ocarinas just this past two weeks very excited about that he's going to take over and demonstrate some multi-chamber prowess okay so here we go hey i'm eric and yes i love multi-chamber ocarinas and i'd like to tell you a little bit just a story of how i came to fall so in love with the songbird multi-chamber so this is the songbird triple harmony ocarina and how did I come to fall in love with this? Let me just tell you briefly the story of how I got into ocarina in the first place. So I've always been into very unusual musical instruments. I grew up actually studying the bagpipe, which I play professionally, both the Scottish bagpipe and the Irish Island bagpipe. And I just love exploring like, unusual musical sounds. Ocarina too, I was a Zelda fan. I played Ocarina of Time, et cetera, growing up. And I always thought, you know, maybe I'll buy an ocarina someday, but I'm also a very frugal person. I don't like to spend money. So I thought, you know, I don't want to buy an ocarina. It costs a lot of money, right? But one day I found this $5 cheap plastic garbage ocarina on the street in LA. It was around the street and I thought, why not? It's $5, I'll buy it. So I got this plastic ocarina, I figured it out in the day and I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. Maybe I'll actually get a real ocarina. So then I finally actually first encountered Songbird Ocarina at Anime Expo later that year. And I found out, hey, there's this business called Songbird Ocarina, it's right here in LA. And at that point I already picked up a few smaller Alto C ocarinas. And I thought, I want to get something a little bit more practical, a little bit, I can do a little bit more with. So I came to Songbird Ocarina for the first time and I thought I'm just going to buy like a base ocarina or maybe a double chamber ocarina to extend my range. But then I found this one, the Triple Harmony Ocarina. And what's really interesting about this ocarina, it was actually a collaboration that when David Ramos was working more closely with Songbird Ocarina and he wanted to make a multi-chamber ocarina following the structure of Giorgio Pacchioni, who makes beautiful, amazing multi-chamber ocarinas, and Pacchioni, he makes it with the second chamber rather than picking up after the E flat into an E natural, as many other multi-chambers do. He starts again on C. So the fingering is parallel between the first and second chambers. You have C, D, E, F, G, C, D, E, F, G, which to me, it was just much more natural to encounter this fingering. And then the third chamber, Pacchioni actually makes it with the, his third chamber. He starts on F, he goes F, G, A, B flat, C, which, I'm not sure why he does that, honestly, but David Ramos, he was thinking it would make more sense to start again on G, G, A, B, C, D. And this also made more sense to me because it even mimics like orchestral string instruments, which in which the strings are arranged in fifths. So for example, a violin, you have your C string within your G string. So it just was a very natural intuitive pattern. And I realized, wow, like this instrument, like how many wind instruments can you play chords with three notes on one instrument? Like I'd never experienced that before and I was so excited. And even though I only wanted to spend like $100 max that day, I came in, the price was like $250, but I had an epiphany that day and I realized this is the reason God invented money. It's, it's the bio greenness. <laughs> so I'm just going to play, play a little piece on this triple greener so you can see some of the harmonic capabilities.
That's why I love this arena. It can do so much. And I really enjoy just the challenge of trying to arrange a piece that will fit across the chambers, get the chords to fit together. There's a lot you can do to do the overlap in the notes among the chambers, as opposed to maybe the more common multi chambers in which the chambers are arranged linearly. So that's the Songbird Harmony Triple. Another less common, less well known multi chamber arrangement that we have, we call this the Lovebirds. And we've made a few different variations of these. So it's two chambers. The first one is a little bit deeper, obviously, and we've experimented with arranging them in fourths or fifths or thirds. This particular one, the chambers are separated by fourths. And here's what this one sounds like. this as well. And that's that's also one of the even main reasons why I became so attracted to Sampo Ocarina is just the innovation that exists here. There's instruments that you can't find anywhere else. I mean even the synesthesia ocarinas that you saw, the synesthesia flutes, like that's just so amazing and beautiful because it adds a whole another dimension of light, visual beauty that corresponds with the music that you hear. And even when the when the synesthesia ocarina first came out, the ocarina of light, I remember I was so excited Durian was only releasing about like 10 of them on the first release. And I was there on my laptop, like ready to buy it and check out, but I actually missed it because everyone bought them within like a minute before I could check out the first time. Then a couple weeks later, I tried again, he released the next batch. And I was actually just around the corner at the Starbucks. I was ready to check out and I got it this time. So the second batch I bought at the Starbucks, I walked over to Songbird and like, hey Durian, I'm here. I just bought your synesthesia over in LA. And I was so excited just to be able to experience so many as a different musical magic opportunities that exist here. And that's really the magic of Songbird Ocarina too, is just exploring new worlds, surpassing the horizons of music and seeing, seeing what we can make to really and truly make music a magical experience. Oh, thank you, Eric. Inspiring. Uh, a quick story about Eric. So when he first uh, applied to work here, I was uh, looking for a, a new office elf. Uh, I didn't know I wanted an office elf. I thought I was just going for an office manager, but I got an extra, um, extra bonus on that one. Uh, when Eric applied, he had also gotten a scholarship to go to Korea and study and teach English as a, as a, a Korean speaker because he had learned Korean in school. And so I told him, well, maybe you should go ahead and do that and, and instead of working here. And he's like, no, I'd rather work at Songbird Ocarina. And I'm like, no, you should go and do this, the scholarship. And uh, a couple weeks later, he let me know that the, the scholarship was a a, a non-financial scholarship, just uh, an opportunity to go there. And he's like, you know, I'd, I actually really rather work at Songbird Up Arena. And so I'm like, all right, come on. And the very next week, his very first week of starting to work, a, a Korean ocarina maker came to town and wanted to visit. And uh, and Eric was able to speak to him in, in Korean. So I knew it was a it was a sign that 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 it was good timing. And and he's been a an amazing. Edition. He's the one who answers the phone and answers your questions and emails, and he's so knowledgeable uh, about everything ocarina and music that on day one that he started working here, uh, he never had to ask me any question about the ocarina models, uh, which keys they're in, what what they pair well with, and he could describe them in the same way you would describe a fine wine. And so it's just been amazing working with Eric. And as you see, he he came in on a Saturday, even though um, there's no uh, official work today. So he's very, his, his dedication runs deep because he loves the ocarina as much as any of us do. And that's, uh, that's very special. And he shows up consistently and, and just loves the work. So it's, it's great. And I always hear amazing music coming from, from up front here. And so that's always encouraging. I'm like, oh, wow, what, what ocarina is that? <laughs> that sounds great. So anyway, I think we're open to questions now, if you have any, any questions for us. So hit us up and we'll see if we can answer your burning inquiries. 
Drew and I have a super quick request of you. I know that I played one of STL's Ocarina. Can I play one of yours before we answer questions? Can you hear me okay? Sure. You want me to play one or you're going to play one? Um, I was He's asking if I could play your so Ocarina. Well. Oh, Just because sure. I recently bought this one and I'm really in love with it. Cool. Let's see him. Super cool the technology that Durian has been able to use to make these pitches uh, be able to light up. Super duper cool. Um, so Durian, I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, the questions that I have here from um, a few people. Um, so uh, we have a question on the question and answer panel. We have a uh, somebody who asks, "Is the ocarina tree still in the workshop?" Oh yeah, you want to see? Let's go over to the ocarina tree. Is our arena tree. Now we do have a shop here. If you're ever in, if you're ever in Los Angeles, uh, we love to give tours. We'll show you where all the magic gets made. You can come see the arena tree and just come and shoot right off of it. So over in in here in sunny Los Angeles, arenas do grow on trees, and so and we have arenas coming out of our ears. So you're welcome to come here. And, Check out our ocarinas, and we'll give you a tour. And here you can sign our our guest book. Here, let's let's sign the guest book. Um, ocarina Festival 2020 loves everything. Ocarina. There you have it, guys. Now we've signed one book next to the Ocarina tree. That's awesome. Thank you for the question. That was a great question. Wow. Would you look at that? <laughs> All right. What's next? All right. We have a really good question, and I, I was thinking of asking this question, so I'm so happy somebody asked it. Um, uh, my friend Stefan, who is very much into Samponia, Ken, Kenna, and other music from South America asks, uh, have you visited South America and had experience with Andean music? Mm. Uh, the closest I've come is Costa Rica. So I've been to Central America and I'm very, oh, wait, I've been to Colombia. And about a week in Colombia. And I, the closest I found to an ocarina in Colombia was a a PVC saxophone that, that a gentleman was making on the street that of course I had to buy, <laughs> um, as all the musical tourists do. And so I'm look, very much looking forward to an Andean adventure, visiting Peru and hearing the uh, whistling vessels in person, maybe visiting some workshops and, and doing a deep dive. I also hear that there are some workshops um, that are centered around healing and music that happen down there uh, on Lake Hot Guatemala, not exactly in South America, but I'm very much looking forward to uh, an Indian musical adventure in, um, in Ecuador, who I'm hoping to visit uh, sometime in the not too distant future. So thanks for that inspiration. And yeah, as soon as uh, things are looking up, actually, I do have a, a trip planned um, in, to Patagonia in December. There's a full solar eclipse happening, and that's in the in the path of totality where the eclipse of the sun is total now it's around the winter solstice i have a feeling it's not gonna happen so i'm not holding my breath but that was my intention to go down to patagonia in argentina but it's on my to-do list thank you for your answer durian really appreciate it some of uh 
the ocarinas that you were showing reminded me of the kenas that they play in South America. And they do, just for your information, uh, have a kena festival over there every year, uh, similar to the ocarina festival, uh, because they have a very thriving kena community. And kena is a, a round flute that doesn't have a, a, a fipple or uh, the wind way that we call it. Instead, like it's kind of like the round flute that you were showing uh, that just you have to do a mouth shape to get the sound. It's, it's really interesting. But uh, I, have a, I have a brief little Kenna story for you. So it was my birthday and I was sitting at my window at night and just having an, enjoying the cool summer breeze when I heard from the distance the beautiful flute playing, some of the most beautiful flute playing I've heard in a long time. And I just sat there for about a half an hour listening to it. And then I'm like, I've got to go out there and find this, this player. They're so good. And so I went outside and found between two large buildings, each one building was about eight stories and the other building was about five stories. And there was about a 50 foot space between them. There's a gentleman there with, with a cana and he had long curly black hair and he was like, looked like a kind of a skater kid. And he was playing a cana and the echo between the two buildings was so beautiful and he was so good. And I, and I, I uh, as I came up to him, he's like, oh, well, here, you know, and I, I showed him my ocarina and I played for him and I ended up giving him the one that I was wearing. Um, and he was so grateful. He gave me his numbers. He says, well, listen, let me take you up into the San Gabriel Mountains. There's a place, there's a trail that I know that is, goes above the clouds. And as you play, the sound echoes off of the cloud bank and you get this beautiful, sound that you don't get anywhere else. I'm still looking forward to going on that, that hike with him. So that's my Kana story. Apparently his, um, his Kana he had gotten from a master and, uh, and he had a whole story around it. There's a whole world, a whole Kana world. And it's, it's an in-notched flute. It's kind of the Shakuhachi of, of South America. Excuse that reference. That's probably, there's probably a lot of Japanese people just got pissed off right now. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, to my, um, un still uncivilized mind, uh, that's how I saw it. But Kena is a whole world, and thank you for uh, inspiring me. I look forward to a, a deep dive into the, the Kena one of these days. Absolutely, Durian. Uh, everybody, please show Durian uh, how much we appreciate that he took the time, and also Eric, that they took the time to come show us the ocarinas from Songbird Ocarina.